Good morning, everybody. Man, it is wonderful to see you here today at the Vista. If we have not met before, my name is Austin. I get to serve here as one of our lead pastors. If you're joining us for the first time, first time in a long time, we're just really glad to have you with us. We hope that you feel loved and welcomed and wanted, that you fit right in and make yourself at home here at the Vista. Before we jump in, a tiny bit of housekeeping. Uh, as Dave mentioned in the video that started off the service, uh, we're going to be tweaking our service time starting July the 3rd, so I think that's three weeks, and we're going to be moving them uh, to 9, so y'all are good, so 9, 10, 15, and 11, 30, so the last two services are going to move up 15 minutes. Uh, as we mentioned about a month, month and a half ago, our area is experiencing a lot of growth, and so we're trying to make sure that we make enough room for anybody who might want to call Vista home, and before we did anything more elaborate, more expensive, we want to make sure that we maximize and steward well what God has actually gifted us with. And we've got a lot of data telling us that fitting those three services in at those three times will allow us to maximize the number of people we can get here on site at Vista on Sunday mornings. And so that's a really, really simple change that's coming again. You're all good because you, you do the Lord's work and you're here for the nine o'clock service. And so you'll be good, but everybody else will be moving up 15 minutes. Starting July 3rd. All right, so today we are, we are taking a break from our summer series called A Shared Gospel because today is Father's Day. So could we give a little hand for all the dads in the room today? Yeah. Uh, now, um, <clears throat> as most of you are aware, Father's Day, like Mother's Day and many other holidays, has become so thoroughly... Y'all like this background? Mac picked it up. Um, so thoroughly commercialized that it's, it's easy for us to miss its deepest meaning because we're all so caught up in this spin cycle of guilt and consumption wherein we buy our father's gifts on Father's Day to show us how much we love them, but mainly because we've been conditioned to feel very guilty if we don't buy them something to show them how much we love them. And so on behalf of all the fathers in the room today, I would just like to let you all know that we know that Americans spend about $20 billion a year on Father's Day gifts. Isn't that crazy? But then we also know that Americans spend about $32 billion a year on Mother's Day gifts. <laughs> so some of y'all need to step y'all's game up because you owe us about $12 billion a year. Surprise, y'all thought we didn't know about that? Y'all thought we dads, we didn't get together, we didn't talk about the fact that mom gets a day at the spa and a flower arrangement so elaborate that we have to take out a second mortgage in order to finance it. Meanwhile, dad gets a tie and a 30-minute nap. That's what dad gets. Why are we still getting ties? I haven't seen a tie in real life in a decade. A decade. <laughs> and so let me help you all out. You want to know what we dads really most want on Father's Day? All we really want is quality time with you. Quality time with you riding on the jet ski that you bought us to show us <laughs> how much that you love us. $12 billion. It's a lot. And of course, I'm kidding, man. We don't really care about the $12 billion that you owe us because you love mom more than us. We just want you to know that, you know, it's kind of a weird time to be a man. You know what I mean? It's a weird time to be a man. I mean, think about it. Since the dawn of, of civilization, men have ruled the world. You know, we've been the, the kings and the pharaohs, the emperors and ambassadors, the chieftains and conquistadors. Our ancient forefathers, they, they saw what they wanted. They told the woman standing closest to them to hold their beer and raise their children. And then they took what they wanted. It's just the way the world worked. And I'm not saying that was right. Obviously, it wasn't right. I'm just saying it's the way it was, and that's all changed very quickly. And this makes this a very weird time to be a man. The great philosopher Ron Burgundy once put it <laughs> something like this. I've got no heart because a she-devil stole it. And you know what the worst part about it is? She's better than me. She's better than me. You know, times are changing. The ladies can do stuff now. And you're going to have to learn how to deal with it. What? Were you saying something? <laughs> Look, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> it 
So as I think we're all aware, uh, the times are changing, and ladies can do stuff now. And that is a wonderful thing that we should embrace as the liberating work of the Spirit of God. You know, a few thousand years ago, the prophet Joel prophesied that when the Holy Spirit was poured out, our, our daughters would prophesy alongside our sons. You remember that prophecy? It's awesome. That when the Holy Spirit was poured out, it would be poured out in equal measure upon males and females. And while various modern political movements have since jumped on the bandwagon, no force on earth has done more to empower equality between the sexes than Christianity. You realize that, right? Uh, because long before enlightened modern Americans were, you know, marching for women's rights in D.C. and burning bras and doing all that good stuff, Jesus of Nazareth was marching around ancient Galilee with a bunch of women whom he was happy to call his friends and disciples. All that to say, feminism in its purest and most biblical expression as a joyful affirmation of the absolute equality between males and females, right? That kind of feminism, the absolute equality between males and females, that is an explicitly Christian phenomenon. That is something Christianity uniquely gifted the world. It is our heritage. It is a gift our faith gave the world. So we dare not let, I'm sure well-intentioned, but lunatic politicians and activists so annoy us with their incessant virtue signaling that we forget that Jesus Christ was treating females like equals long before it was politically and socially fashionable to do so. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and then all that said, I do think it's very important to circle back to this assertion that it's, it's a very weird time to be a man. Because while we should absolutely celebrate the liberating work of the Spirit of God among our daughters and our sisters and our mothers and our grandmothers in the faith, this has resulted in this place where a lot of men, a lot of us modern men, we're a little bit lost in the world right now. What do I mean by that? Well, a couple summers ago, we had our men's ministry leadership team read a book called The Boy Crisis. It's a very interesting little book. It's built upon a very simple proposal that there is this boy crisis going on in modern society. A um, few stats to throw at you. First off, there's a boy crisis in modern American culture. Over 40% of American children now grow up in fatherless families, which means 25 million American children are growing up without their dads. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 85% of youths in prison come from fatherless homes. 90% of homeless or runaway children come from fatherless homes. And this last one is the saddest one. Fatherlessness is the most common characteristic of youths who commit suicide. How sad is that? Kids who do the worst thing possible, who take their own lives, what do they most have in common? They didn't have their dads around. That's the thing they tend to have in common. And there are all sorts of reasons for why this is, is going on, but the book makes a very compelling case that the primary reason for it is something that he calls the purpose void. It's really easy to understand. You'll understand it as soon as I give you just a couple sentences description. Here's how it works. All of us desire and need purpose. More than happiness, more than safety, more than comfort, we desire and need purpose purpose. In fact, most of us are fine without happiness, safety, or comfort so long as we have purpose. And from time immemorial, men had a very clear purpose. It was a twofold purpose. What were men? Men were protectors and men were providers. This is what men did. You've got to realize that for most of human history, the world has been a, uh, a pretty rough place, right? I know a lot of us feel like the world's so bad right now. No, it's not. The world is the safest, gentlest place it has ever been. It's the gentlest it's ever been in human history. You've got to remember that for most of human history, there, there were no human rights. Everyone's talking about their rights, their human rights. Well, those are a very recent invention, man. They did not exist until very recently. There are very few laws. There was very little technology or education to level the rather brutal playing field that everybody was playing on. So for most of human history, men needed to protect and provide for their family, for their tribe, for the community. That was their purpose, and it was so clear. And like I just said, you can endure just about anything so long as you have a purpose. So that's how it was. That's how it's always been. But then things start to change very rapidly. 
In particular, a lot of advances in technology and education start changing human culture in so profound ways. And we inevitably arrive at this place where men are not needed to protect and provide like they once were. For example, for all of human history, men had to like regularly protect their family from wild animals. On a Monday, you'd you'd have to save your toddler from a saber-toothed tiger. On Wednesday, you'd have to grab him from the grasp of some sort of enormous crocodile. That was normal, guys. That was every day of the week you were saving your family from a wild animal. Fellas in the room today, when is the last time you had to protect your family from a wild animal? Yesterday. Yesterday, what'd you do? (laughs) Did your dad, did he swat a mosquito? Yeah, he swatted a mosquito. That's great. What are we going to do? We're going to swat a mosquito. We're going to spray a wasp with some wasp spray from 100 yards away. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but when I kill a wasp, man, I carry around his carcass like I've killed a a lion with my bare hands on the Serengeti. And we just don't have to protect our family from wild animals anymore. In the same way, men don't have to provide in the way they once did. Because as it turns out, ladies can do stuff. (laughs) A lot of stuff really well and so men simply are not needed to provide financially the way they once were and you get it you can think it's a good thing you can think it's a bad thing you can think it's a complicated thing but it just is what it is men are no longer needed to protect and provide like they used to and that means that men are experiencing what this purpose void or this thing that we've always done it's just not needed in the same way anymore and we get more than a little lost And that finally brings us to our text for today. I've made a long approach to the runway. Thank you for your patience. (laughs) Malachi 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. This is the very last chapter in the Old Testament. Malachi 4, verses 1 through 6. The prophet says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for those of you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth, and you'll skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord. And remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel. Now behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Malachi 4, verses 1 through 6. So here in Malachi 4, at the very end of, of the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi speaks of something that he and other prophets call the day of the Lord, okay, this coming day in history when God would intervene and God would finally set things right. And then Malachi mentions Elijah. He's one of the greatest Hebrew prophets. He was so great, in fact, that legend has it that he wasn't even killed. He was just like sucked up to heaven one day. And so this tradition had kind of grown up around Elijah wherein it was thought that one day Elijah would return. And his return would mark the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. The end of the world as we know it, and the beginning of the world as God actually wants it. Right? And so when that happens, when Elijah comes back and God finally sets the world right, what's going to happen? What's it going to look like? How will we know it's happening? Well, here's what Malachi says in the two verses that end the Old Testament. Malachi 4, 5 through 6. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he's going to restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And how interesting is it that the Old Testament ends not with some big cosmic promise of victory, on the grandest scale imaginable, but with this teeny, tiny promise of reconciliation on the smallest scale possible. Because Elijah is going to return, and God is going to set things right. And what that will mean first and foremost and most specifically is that God is going to start putting families back together. 
God's going to turn the hearts of fathers back to their children, the hearts of children back to their fathers. The first sign that God's new world is breaking into this old sinful world is that God is going to bring about uh, reconciliation between fathers and their children. I love the way Fleming Rutledge put this. She says, Malachi 4 has all sorts of apocalyptic imagery. It depicts the coming of the Lord of hosts and the final judgment of the wicked. So the passage has a huge cosmic setting in view at first. Then, suddenly and unexpectedly, it narrows down to a very small focus. Family conflict. Because this is the worst of all curses. If the hearts of the parents are not turned to the children, and the hearts of the children to the parents, the result will be a permanent condition of living under the wrath of God. That's why the prophet Malachi speaks of the repairing of family relationships as the sign of the final triumph of God over the wickedness of the human race. Now, many of us in here today are fathers, and many of us are not. But every single one of us in here today has a father. I don't know if your father was good. I don't know if your father was bad. I don't know if your father was absent. I don't know if your father was present. I don't know any of that. But what I do know in no uncertain terms is that the very last thing that the Old Testament tells us is that God is on a mission to redeem the entire world. And you've got a very important role to play in that. And the most important thing that you can do to do your part in God's redemption of the world is to let God use you to bring redemption, healing, and reconciliation in your family. That's yours to do. So men, fathers, I know it's a weird time to be a man. I do. And I know that so many of you are lost because you've lost your purpose. I see it every day, guys who have lost their purpose. And so I need you to hear me on this, okay? Your families and your children and other people's families and other people's children, they need you to wake up. They need you to step up. They need you to stop wasting your life, your one and only life on the endless pursuit of your success, your status, your pleasure, your entertainment, your hobbies, for God's sake. They need you to step up. But they don't need you to step up, hold on, they don't need you to step up to be the boss. No, they need you to step up and be like Jesus. That's what they need you to do. Because as I recall, Jesus said that he came not to be served, but to what? To serve. That he did not come to be the boss, though it was well within his rights to do so. He came to be the what? He came to be the head servant. This is how Jesus says it in Matthew 20, verses 24 through 28. James and John have basically asked if they can be Jesus' co-bosses, right? Now, hearing this, the ten, the ten who did not ask yet to become the co-bosses, though they were thinking it, they became indignant with the two brothers, with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself, and he said, Hey, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. They all want to be the boss. But it shall not be this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served. Think about that. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this brings us back to this this purpose void that so many of us modern men feel. To the extent that we're struggling with finding our purpose, because things have changed really, really quickly on us. And we are wired, biologically wired in so many ways to be protectors and providers, and we just don't need to do it in the same way. God's patience with us and care for us is infinite. God understands. God understands. Because you don't need to be ashamed for being a man. And not all masculinity is toxic. Is there such a thing as toxic masculinity? Of course, but not all masculinity is toxic, and we have to stop treating men like they are violent and stupid and emotionally challenged just because they're men, for God's sake. On behalf of all the guys, I just got to tell you, like, the fact that we're not as emotional as you, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're better than us. It just means you're more emotional than us. 
And we need everybody and all the giftings to make the world go around. We have to stop treating men like they're stupid because they are men. We are smart enough to pick up on it, all right? We are smart enough to pick up on that. But then, to the extent that we're struggling with finding our purpose, because we're used to running things, we're used to being the boss, and we don't get to run things and be the boss like we used to, ah, man, to the extent that we're struggling with that, I think honesty demands that we admit that it would appear like we never actually understood our purpose. Because our purpose was not, is not, and will never be to rule. Our purpose is not to be the boss. No, rather now and forevermore, our purpose, our only purpose, our ultimate reason for being here is what? It's to serve, man. And if you're too manly for that, it means you're, you're manlier than Jesus Christ. And I don't think you want to say you're manlier than Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus came to do, be the head servant. A couple of weeks ago, we, uh, we packed up the boys for our first big family vacation. We, we left little sister with the grandparents, not because she's a woman, but because she's two. <laughs> she's very good at it. We hopped on a plane with them for the first time, and we were going to go up to Colorado for a week in the mountains. Oh, man, I was, I was very excited about this trip. May had been a very long month. Texas was approaching the surface of the sun season. You know what I'm talking about? Where you walk outside and you just die. Just immediately, <laughs> heat stroke, dead. We were going to go hiking, and, you know, had a little bit of snow. We're going to catch some trout. It's going to be an awesome trip. So we're, we're in the airport in Austin, literally boarding our plane when I start reading the news on my little app, and, and I read about the school shooting in Uvalde. And no details had really emerged at that point, um, in particular about the shooter. But the one thing I knew instantly was that the person who had done this would prove to be a lonely, troubled, violent young man who didn't have a father around. Because that's who it always is. And I, I'm not going to mention their names because they don't deserve to have their names mentioned. But you look back at the people, the sick people who perpetrate these horrific acts of violence, and it's always the same person. It is a lonely, troubled, violent young man who didn't have a dad around. A study was done a few years ago on recruits of ISIS. The study found that the most common characteristic among ISIS recruits was that they were boys who didn't have dads around. Something about it that makes us so susceptible. And so I'm boarding this plane, you know, on my way to the mountains with Allison and the boys, and I read about this horrific tragedy. And, and like all of you, I so badly wanted to do something about it. But I felt so helpless. What am I going to do? I'm, I'm going on a plan up in the mountains. I don't have any service. I'm not going to be here on, on Sunday to like help our church think and process through it. I felt so frustrated, so helpless. But then I remembered this quote that I had shared with you a few weeks ago. It was in the sermon about how you don't have to change the world. Do you remember? You haven't memorized all my sermons? That's okay. <laughs> it's by a guy named Wendell Berry. Here's what my man Wendell Berry says. A couple who make a good marriage and raise healthy, morally competent children are serving the world's future more directly and surely than any political leader, though they never utter a public word. Now, I do not know if I am raising morally competent children. Jury's still out. We're hoping for the best. But I was reminded that God did want me to do something about this horrific awful tragedy, that God was calling me to do something more than just thoughts and prayers. Obviously, God was calling me to do something. I was reminded that the primary political action I could take, that the greatest contribution that I could make to making the world a more merciful and just place was to love and discipline and cherish the two little boys that God had gifted me with, right? Sadly. Um, Y'all, my greatest political action will be who these two kids become, period. That will be my greatest contribution to the common good, to making the world a more peaceable place. 
And so it is a weird time to be a man. Oh, it's so weird. And all of us, males and females, we're all clumsily sorting through this new day and age together. And so we need to be patient with one another instead of condescending with one another. In our clumsiness, everybody's walking around like baby giraffes right now, okay? It is difficult to figure out. And yet, while a lot of stuff has become much more complicated related to fatherhood, masculinity, sure, the most important thing is still every bit as simple and clear as it has ever been. Guys, you are here to serve. Whoever God has put in front of you for however long God has you here. That is your purpose. And there is no greater purpose. There is no better way to spend your life. You get to spend your life doing what Jesus himself did. Amen? Let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you for today. We come before you on this day where we, you know, we we honor our fathers. And we want to do that. We honor our fathers who have, man, loved us and cherished us. None of our fathers have been perfect. Some of our fathers perhaps have been very, very bad. We know that. We confess that. We bring it all before you. And yet, we also believe, as Malachi prophesied, that, oh, God, you are stubborn And you are on a mission to redeem the world and you refuse to give up and you will turn the hearts of fathers back to their children. The hearts of children back to their fathers. I know that in this room today there is so much brokenness, so many relationships that are so fractured between fathers and their children. And I pray that you would even now start putting those relationships back together. We then pray just a bigger prayer for all the guys in the room today. It's a weird time to be a man. A lot of it's really good, a lot of it's really complicated, and I just pray that you would remind us that the most important thing is still as simple as it has ever been. We are here to serve, to love whoever you have put in front of us, forever long you have us here, to use strength, discipline, and whatever gifts you have given us to wash the feet of those you've put in front of us. I pray that you would affirm us in that purpose this morning. And we would embrace it, not reluctantly, but God, with such deep joy because it is good work to do. What better way could we spend our lives? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.